All right, here we are. I feel like I'm in a in an airplane, you know? This is Blog Talk Radio from the sky high. This is your host, Dr. Deb Carlin, and my co-host, my co-pilot, Dr. Charlie Cartwright. Good morning, Charlie. Look out, look, clouds. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. We're already off to a raucous start here before the show even began. I love it. The show before the show. The show before the show. Yeah, I, I like it when we we get to do the countdown because, you know, we started on um, Blog Talk Radio and then Zoom starts and in and, and and only have five seconds, you know, because they say your show will start in five seconds. Mm -hmm. And so I'm trying to click on record over here. And so people get like a two second preview when we're doing that little countdown, you know, which I can never keep up with. It's like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> what's it what was this what was that game we'd play as kids buck buck how many fingers up never played that one yeah it was some kind of really stupid thing you would and it, here's how it would go it's like uh you know there's a few kids together like maybe three or five kids together and you go buck buck how many fingers how many fingers do i have up and you'd hold them like down below or behind your back or something and it was it was a way to vote to get your own way and so like if people guessed, whoever guessed how many, how many, like, okay, whose yard are we going to play in? Okay. We want to play in Deb Carlin's yard. All right. Buck, buck, how many fingers up? And you know, it didn't matter because the person would always cheat. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. <laughs> it's funny. What kind of games did you play as a kid? Well, let's see. Outdoors played a lot of football, of course. Imagine that. And then I ended up going yeah. and playing college football. So yeah, played quite a bit of football, neighborhood football, <laughs> football, guy. a lot of, a lot of monopoly as far as a board game. I and, love um, monopoly. Yeah. I played uh, my grandmother taught me how to play uh, spades and ah. uh, how to play gin rummy. And <clears throat> so I still enjoy playing cards. I played chess me quite too. a bit. Me too. And then um, that was, that was pretty much it really. Who taught you how to play chess? My dad did actually. My dad did too. I yeah. love that. And isn't yeah. it an intriguing game? It's fascinating. I really love it. And I, you know, now that you say this, I really, I need to, that's something I, of course you can do it online now, which is nice. Um, but I enjoy that once we get back to some more normalcy, uh, I enjoy that face-to-face, -face, that whole, it's it's such a intriguing game, but then yes. you if you're playing with people you know and friends, there's a whole conversation that goes along mm -hmm. uh, during the game. You can be talking about so many topics. So I enjoy that game. It's very cerebral. Mm -hmm. um, it makes you sharper. So it's a it's yeah. A good game. In my normal house, <clears throat> I have a room. I sort of set up it for games where I keep a chess bard always out and it's a chess board that actually doubles the board flips over so if you want it if you want it on the chess board side you can put the chess pieces there or the checker pieces and when you flip it over you can play backgammon you know it's interesting you say that because in my office there is a chess board really <laughs> yes and so i love that game i, do I need to i need to get back to it you know i've been looking for because my online game has kind of gotten compromised. Uh, so I'm like, you know what? I should just move, switch to chess. Yeah. You know what? I don't have a chess board these days, but I would love to. You know, it'd be really fun is yeah. to dedicate a computer and a camera to the board mm -hmm. and play back and forth with somebody, wouldn't it? Yeah. And then, like, you could go in there at any time and make the move, but you would have to, you know, do an indication on it. Yeah. I think that'd be cool. That'd be really cool. I like it. I like it too. So here's, here's what I wrote today for our show. Oh, by the way, this is your host, Dr. Deb Carlin and my co-host, Dr. Charlie Cartwright. And this is Black Talk Radio and the show is called Freedom Fridays here on the K factor where K equals kindness and the factors are all the things that lead to it. And we think Charlie and I think that the idea of having a show about freedom is really the kindest thing that we can do for you 
absolutely. It's anytime, but especially here during 2020, when we have a lack of kindness in the world, and boy, oh boy, do we have a lack of kindness in our country, this great country of ours. And, and so here's what I wrote for us for today, you know, Freedom Fridays with Dr. Charlie Cartwright and, and me, Dr. Deb Carlin. As the weeks slide by and the mood of the country is led by anger and fear, it is essential for us to tune into us, Deb and Charlie here, who our mission is to share our knowledge and help you understand how to awaken and make each day filled with optimism and productivity because no matter what else is going on around you and this is our our ongoing conversation you know it takes all kinds of side loops as especially when we're in flight like we are today <laughs> in our little airplane here um there's a lot of ways to look at freedom but it's all about what you're doing inside of your head here and you know i americans are feeling really pinched i mean it, the issues on censorship right now are huge holy cow censorship are you kidding me i thought we were in america aren't we yeah we are but it has um, evolved or devolved mm -hmm. yeah that's a good way to put it you know i um i got up the other morning and this might sound really corny but i got up the other morning and i and i was doing um some some morning prayers and at one point I took my hands from being folded and I put my hand over my heart and when I did I I found myself quietly just in my mind not out loud saying the pledge of allegiance and then I remember how much I loved it when I was in grade school and in kindergarten um Miss D Rose played the piano beautifully and she'd always have on a lovely dress and she wore these nylons with the seam up the back the really old-fashioned kind and high heels but they were you know just chunky enough that it, she didn't look spooky she just looked like a real lady she was very elegant she taught us how to skip hop jump hop jump and we would go on the circle around the the wooden floor that was painted and and uh it was it was a a, a kindergarten room filled with love and gentility and lots of learning and and we would sing my country tis of thee and I was sitting there and I have my hand over my heart and I, and I was think and I was singing out loud, my country tis of thee. And I thought, you know, the words to the song are beautiful. The sentiment that it was written with, I mean, just there's so much beauty about America that nobody seems to really be talking about now. It's all this, come here, I'm going to punch you in the head. What did you say? Okay, you shut up. You know? Yeah. I mean, what 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 is all that? What why? Why why, Charlie, has it has it devolved into this um set of of behaviors that are so unsavory? And I don't care. It, it, I hate it that we have to say you know what side you're on. Why would there be sides? Isn't everybody whether you're a, a liberal or a Democrat, whether you're a conservative or, you know, a moderate or whatever we want to call them, left wing, right wing, you know, on an airplane, you can't, you can't fly without both wings, sure. you know, but we want to like annihilate one another or something. I don't like that. Yeah. It's disappointing. And I think you know, I look at the workplace, for instance, and then there's so many correlations between, you know, workplace is a microcosm of society, right? Yeah. And in the workplace, one of the things that happens is there's bullying, right? There are bullies in the workplace, but you can't have bullies without them being enabled. Yeah, that's right. 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 And so bullies get enabled several ways. Number one, they are typically very savvy. They know when to do it, when not to do it, what to say. They're very savvy because mm -hmm. they've been around. Okay. And what happens is they get enabled. Well, how do they get enabled? Because people look the other way. Because people don't speak up. Because people are afraid to say anything. And then what happens is you have a team of, of 20 and 18 are silent and two bullies are running the place. Mm -hmm. And it, it goes over and over again. So in our society, 
when we don't stand up to these behaviors, when we, we, there's a, there's a, I remember going to a school at FedEx, <clears throat> a manager's leadership school when I was, at, and I work for FedEx Ground, not FedEx Express, it's FedEx Ground. So FedEx Ground's corporate office is in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So we went to Pittsburgh for this leadership school. And I'm the biggest lesson that came away, there were two things I learned in that school that were awesome. But what, but of the two, this lesson really stuck as well. And they said, the instructor said, what's tolerated is taught. Oh, man. Isn't right? that the truth? Isn't that the truth? And so we, we tolerate, we're, we're tolerating it. We're accepting these radical voices to be the loudest and people are waiting for it to pass by. They're waiting for it to go away. And so every day these people are enabled, they're also emboldened, right? And so my father used to say, uh, uh, of course, he was very, in a very negative connotation, but it, it has a lot of truth to it. You give them an inch, they take a mile, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what's been happening. And so people are just sitting silently by and these people aren't going away. And so their voices get louder and louder. And then all of a sudden, at some point, there's a tipping point where now it's evidently it's acceptable behavior. I know. And I remember speaking to a group, you know, it was a medical group, pain management group. And it was one of the last trainings that, that I've, completed before the outbreak, right? Before the COVID, everything mm -hmm. really hit. And I remember speaking to this group and you know, it's a very competitive business and they've got to be very, very customer centric and the way they deal with clients and the way they deal with one another. It's so important the environment that they create when someone walks into a clinic in pain, oh, yeah. they feel like they're in the right place, right? right. And I remember telling them that you know, if you, if you talk to your clients, the, the way the president of the United States speaks to media and other people and the way he treats p other people, you're going to get fired. Okay. You can't, you can't get away with that in the business world. And so out in the, out in the community environment, there's all of this vitriol, yeah. but if you try to bring that in the workplace, you're going to end up in human resources, right? Yeah, right. You're going to, you're going to lose your job. And so if it's not acceptable inside the walls in, a, in an organization, in a corporation, I would never go to a grocery store where people mistreated me or a mm -hmm. restaurant where people mistreated me. Mm -hmm. When people get outside the context of work and all of a sudden they feel like it's somehow acceptable to be really negative and nasty. And so we've got an undercurrent in our culture that of people that are accepting it and it's disappointing. And I'll say one other thing. So, cause I worked for UPS for 10 years and I worked for FedEx for 10 years. And so yeah. as tough as that was, I just don't think you can get a better understanding of what it takes to be a professional and mm -hmm. what it takes to be a high level customer service and what it takes to be efficient, all these things. And so many lessons. So I was at a training school for U at, at, at UPS, and it was a sales training school held in Louisville, Kentucky, which is where their air hub is. Mm -hmm. And I remember we had one of the instructors was from New York. His name was Mike. I can't remember his last name, but I can still see his face. And he gave a really passionate speech. And he talked about he was from New York, New York. Okay. And so he says, you know how tough it is to be from what – everyone considers the worst facility in the country. Oh, right. New York, New York. It was our toughest, you know, lowest service levels, just a lot of issues in that really? facility because, you know, UPS driver, that's a great paying job in Kansas. Right. Yeah. But if you're in New York, New York, we had drivers living in their vans. Oh this no. Is, yeah. This is in their eight. This is in the, uh, uh, so this is in the late eighties. Okay. So no adjustment in, in pay because of where you there's, live. There's some, but it's just so astronomically high. cost of living is oh, so yeah, astronomically yeah. high. So because every union had in these different 
um, states have negotiated. There's a national contract, and then there's locals that have negotiated, like the vacation days may be different, holidays and stuff like that. <clears throat> and then hourly rate may be slightly different, but not significantly. Okay. So he said, you know, in New York, by our facility, he said, so several blocks. Now, this is, again, this was 90, 91, so it could change by now. But he said, a few blocks from our facility, there's an abandoned car, and there's a dead dog by it. And he said, those have been there for years. Years? He's, now he said, here we are, we're in Louisville, Kentucky. He said, you don't see that around here. Why? He said, but pe he says, because people don't accept it. He said, but in New York, he said, we accept it. And he said, so it was a speech is about raising our level of acceptance. And so we need to raise our level of acceptance. What we're going to mm -hmm. accept from our leaders mm -hmm. um, because they're setting an example. Oh, yeah. And it's been horrible on both sides of the aisle. Absolutely. Okay? Both absolutely sides. yeah nobody gets a pass or, or a, nobody gets an a nobody no, gets a b no no they all know. get like f right and so it's been disappointing um as an american it's been you know i'm ashamed of how some of our leaders do business i am and too charlie I'm not, I'm not embarrassed because i'm not doing anything to be embarrassed about but i'm ashamed that our elected shameful. officials behave in this way. It's shameful. You know, I, I, I dial it back. And I remember as a child that when, when we were in grade school, if you got in trouble at school, your parents right away said, well, what did you do? Exactly. You know, we're, we're going to go talk to the teacher. I mean, you better, you better straighten up and fly right. You know, and trouble. Yeah, exactly. Big trouble. And then, and then, uh, you know, now I, I was, I was just stunned walking into, into education as a consultant and having people say the parents, I mean, we've had to change the playground. We've had to do this. We've had to do that. We have to wrap the children in, you know, swaddling cloth, nothing happens to them. Don't let them bump their head or have anybody offend their little tiny feelings. Well, wait a second. We were treated with respect when I was growing up in school, but now parents, they get a call from the principal or a note from the teacher uh, and they, they're going to come in and litigate. I, I could not believe it. This is drop dead serious. And this was not just in one school or one, one district, but at various places around the country, parent teacher day, parent teacher meetings, there would be teachers and not just the brand new ones, but there would be teachers of substance there who were in the bathroom throwing up sick because they would have to tell the parents something that they didn't want to have to tell them. Like your kiddo is, and then you fill in the blank, whatever it is. And these were really good people, really good educators. So I had no idea when I came in what, what my tasks were going to be in terms of trying to be helpful. And I was, I was, crushed by it you know just so sad my heart was squeezed the other thing that runs through my mind here is watching television as a child the remote control was the thing that was came along later and you would watch a network two five seven or nine and then public television was on 11 or nine depending on where you were at and in my household before you turn the tv on you had to look at the paper tv guide and, and ask your parents if you could turn the TV on and you had done what you were going to watch and ask permission. And when we would watch the news, which was on at six o'clock or whatever it was, I don't even remember there being morning news and there was the 10 o'clock news. Those people were dressed up um, and they were very proper and you didn't, you know, it was one commentator giving you the news. And then somebody else would come on and give you the weather. Somebody else would come on and give you the, the sports. But the person who was sitting there, Walter Cronkite, uh, you know, we could go through a bunch of different names, but they were distinguished. And if they did have somebody on the on their screen with them, it was very polite. And it was I talk and you talk like you and I are doing, right? Um I don't understand when it became acceptable 
I'm going to invite you onto the show and I'm going to berate you. I'm going to holler at you. I'm going to diminish you. I'm going to make you feel horrible. Or we're co-hosts and I'm going to talk over you. And the rudeness has infiltrated our entire culture. The media, I blame the media and whoever finances the media for the cut. You're right. The collars do go out of control there. The, the media uh, really needs to be held accountable for this horrible behavior. I, I mean, I watch this and I think to myself, I don't like the way most of the women dress. I think that they're incredibly provocative, great looking, beautiful females. But when it's winter and I see you wearing a short sundress with no sleeves and a scoop neck and you're sitting there and the camera pulls back and I get to see your gorgeous legs, give me a break. What does that have to do with the news? There's just the, it's, it's provocative. It's over-sexualized. It's rude. It's yelling. It's not, hi, come on in. Here you are. And it's not reality. And no. it's all, it's all about the ratings and these people are tuning in. And, and so the reality of it is if we're, we're tired of the clowns and we need to stop buying tickets to the circus and, and that's what we, that's what we've been doing. You know, people keep buying tickets by tuning in tuning in tuning in if people weren't tuning into those shows they would go away let me ask you and, yeah let me ask you a question i'm watching the news and i flip around because i don't want to just get one perspective so i'll go to msnbc i'll go to cbs i'll go to um fox and i and then i'll go like on the on the cable network to like the bbc and stuff like that How is it possible that we've got all this outrage about whether you're masked and you're social distancing? But I saw the win of the Lakers game. Now, was I dreaming? Did the Lakers recently win a game? Yeah, they won. They recently won the, the championship. That's what I thought. Yeah. So I'm watching them and it now was a beautiful scene. No criticism. However, Here's all these big dudes. They're all huddled in. I mean, they would fit into our squares here on Zoom. And there's a dozen of them. And I mean, they're they're hot, they're sweaty, they're, you know, oozing their juices, you know? And they're screaming and laughing and hugging and kissing each other. And I mean, it's wonderful, it's beautiful. However, I'm sorry, I'm a little confused. Yeah, so they, so they had, uh, so I, know, I do know a little about this. I'm not an NBA fan, but I do know a little about this because a friend of mine's in television. So they went into that bubble. They went, they actually went into a bubble mm -hmm. and they were in a facility. I remember you they telling were, me that. They weren't allowed to leave. So yeah. they've been there for like two months and you had, to, and they were testing them twice a week. Mm. And so, and if you left the bubble for any reason, then there was two weeks before you could come back and all this stuff. So everybody in there, uh, from officials to the television crew, to the wait staff, everybody's been in this bubble. So they know that there's no uh, COVID present. Even so, even though you've been in the bubble for a month, they were still testing twice a week, which is kind of brutal. Did uh, anybody so ever test positive? NBA players, uh, anybody like in the bubble early on, um, you had to test negative to get in, you know, like, so you had to go through all this testing even to get into the bubble. Then once you were in the bubble, you weren't allowed to leave. And so I think, I don't think anyone now, the only thing that got you out of the bubble is if you, <laughs> you didn't comply with with their protocols inside, which was the twice a week testing and all that. And they did, my, my friend told me they put some people out because they, uh, you know, didn't submit to the test or whatever it was. They, they did keep people out, but yeah, they had no issues, but they, you know, they had it all kind of uh, quarantined the, the facility there and everything was, was uh, that way. So, you know, and I'm glad that Thank they you finished for that reminder. Yeah, I'm glad they finished the season, but it'd be tough to be in a location for two months without the ability to leave, you know, so, um, but they did finish the season under those circumstances and got it done, but that's what happened.
Okay. Well, that makes me feel a lot better because I thought to myself, why isn't anybody why isn't anybody up in arms about this? And I do I do remember a video of yours that I watched with you with your friend who's in the bubble talking about oh. the price of the food. Yeah, he wasn't too happy about that. <laughs> yeah, but he was hilarious. He was really funny. Yeah, we had a great conversation, but yeah, he wasn't too. Yeah, that was a funny, that was a funny clip. And you know, that was um early on. Well, it was at the end of the podcast. Like we were all done with the interview and everything, but I just left the recording going because sometimes <laughs> the best conversation happens before you get started or even afterwards. So I had right. the recording going. Right. So then afterward, I had my guy splice that out. We actually made a little promo of that with that in there, <laughs> just that little two minute conversation. It was so funny. Uh, it was, it was, was funny. cracking up. And that, and that captures his personality to a T. Oh my God. He's one of these people that, you know, if you just meet him on the surface, you would know how hilarious he is at times. And he can, he can really be hilarious when he wants to be. And it was a great conversation. Well, he was hilarious. He was really hilarious. We, we, we ought to figure out a way to, to share that. I mean, really, it was just too funny and you were yeah. cracking up. I mean, it was just a riot. Yeah, so, so, so for our listening and viewing audience, it, you know, it's just Charlie with a good friend of his in this incubation lockdown, and the guy is just incensed. It's a potato. <laughs> it's thirty-two dollars for mashed potatoes. I don't want these thirty-two dollar uh, mashed potatoes. You know what a hamburger costs here, Charlie? <laughs> <laughs> what was the coffee? Wasn't it like $8? Yeah, something like coffee? 11 bucks for a cup of coffee. Yeah, and he, oh, it was tea. It was tea, <laughs> right? Green oh, tea. that's right, the tea. <laughs> and he's like, there's no whiskey in it. <laughs> there's no bourbon in it. <laughs> this yeah, is $11 for a cup of tea. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> of green tea. Yeah, it was just too much. Well, you know, this, what you, you and I are doing here, this is the real news. You know, life is not about all this box them, fight them, womp them, you know, pound them, uh, humiliate them behavior. Life is about what human beings really need. We want information. We want human connection. We want to be able to look at each other and feel safe with each other. I mean, like when we come in here every Friday, we're always happy to see one another. It's friendly and we want to pull our audience into friendly and it's funny. And I mean, I think we're funny and, and it, <laughs> it's somewhat intelligent and we're looking for ways to help people get freedom in their, in their, in their brain and, and think, okay, wait a second. If you feel pinched and locked down by the news, the, the news out there, no matter what, what broadcast you're listening to, if you're, if you're feeling trapped by what you're witnessing, you know, come here. It's a safe place. <laughs> it is a safe place. It really is a safe place. You know, that, that, that morning that I woke up that Sunday morning after the first night of riots here in Chicago, that Saturday night when, I mean, I sat here and I watched TV and I'm watching, I'm watching local TV as we're all sitting there with our mouths hanging open as I just, I could not believe what I was witnessing, the violence, the anger, the how many people were just ripping and crashing everything. And I went downtown the next morning, Sunday morning, got up at around five, got my coffee, got a thermos and bravely drove downtown to Michigan Avenue, you know, Lakeshore Drive, get off on of Michigan Avenue. And I arrive and I'm, I'm watching this scene and I drove around for an hour and I just, I, I was crying. I could not stop crying. I was so overwhelmed. And, and then I, I, I was gonna head back home and I thought, no, I'm turning the camera around. I'm going to do, I'm going to do a Facebook live. And I, I did a Facebook live. It started out on me. And, and I said, look, you've never seen me look like this before on camera. You know, my face looks terrible. I've been crying. 
this last hour, I have to share with you because I'm betting that so many of you don't know what happened here last night. And quite frankly, I bet not a single one of you are where I'm at. So I want to share this with you. So I turned the camera around and it's pretty much on my, well, you wouldn't know anything about dash cams, but <laughs> <laughs> this is, by the way, friends, dash cam Charlie. And if you go to LinkedIn and YouTube and put in dash cam dr charlie cartwright you're gonna find him and it's amazing he's he's giving his pearls of wisdom wearing some groovy t-shirt every different day do you do it five days a week yeah five days every once in a while i'll sneak another day in but typically monday through friday I do a little dash cam wisdom man they're great and they're just like what three minutes three to five yeah mm -hmm. So I turn the camera around on the dashboard and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm panning it back and forth so that people can see the middle of the road and then the left side and the right side. And I'm explaining what, what it is that's happened. And I'm going to tell you, Facebook usually stops you after about 50 minutes to an hour. And it, this went on for about three hours. And, and I had people, I, I had people joining and joining and joining and joining until probably, I don't know, there was 85 or hundred people there or something like that. And there were some people, here's my point in telling the story. There were some people who in the thread, they're making their comments. So I'm driving really slow, got both hands on the wheel. And I mean, I'm driving like at idle speed and um, they're writing and I'm, you know, pulling over, stopping at a stop sign and I'm responding. And some people were very combative with me. You know, you care about the buildings. What about the people? Okay, so, all right. I do care about the people. The, the people in the buildings are pretty intertwined, you know? So some people were saying, bring them on camera, bring those people on camera. So I started bringing people on camera who were in opposition to me and who really wanted to come in and like just pummel me. And you know what, Charlie? I refused, I brought them on and I, and I refused to bring them on without saying, I would really like for us to have a conversation of gentility. Come on, come on in. And they came in and there'd be a little bit of a tussle, but you know, even when people are really angry, there's a way for us to continue to invite in with the calmness of our voice, with the statements that we make so that we can be kind. And, and there, and there was a, there ended up being a tremendous amount of agreement. And here's what, here's what uh, spawned my telling of the story. There were people who were saying, would you keep this thread open? Would you come back here every week and do safe, the safe Sunday place? And, you know, I said, well, I don't know. I, I really don't know because right now, you know, we're in like the second hour of this. And I'm, I'm feeling a bit in the way I've spent. I mean, emotionally, this is extremely difficult. And I might just be a little too selfish to have to commit to that. I mean, thank you for that. But it, it really was a place where, and it's never too late to do it. And I drove back up north and, you know, came from the city and, and drove up to, to where I'm at and, and shared with people the difference between agony and, and peacefulness ended it at the beach and actually had one of these people who was really angry um, want to do a prayer at the end. And I thought that was really sweet. It was really lovely. So we all came together and, and uh, decided that the thing that we all had in common was we didn't want anything ruined. We didn't want people hurt. And, and there's a lot of ways in which people get hurt. You know, your business gets annihilated, you're getting hurt. So, it, it w people are looking for safe, gentle spaces. Yeah, without a doubt. And it's just important to provide that, I think, in any way that we can. And uh, the more people that step forward and do that, the better that we're all going to be. <clears throat> I gave a presentation the other day, and I talked about this responsibility, you know, whose responsibility is it? And there's those four people, I call them the body team, you know, everybody, anybody, somebody, and nobody, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's everybody's responsibility. But the problem 
lies when everybody knows that anybody can do it. But a big problem happens when everybody thinks somebody's doing it. Because when everybody thinks somebody's doing it, nobody ends up doing it. Mm-hmm. It's everybody's job. Anybody can do it. Somebody should do it. But every time that everybody thinks that somebody's doing it, nobody's doing it. Yeah, it ain't so, happening. That somebody has to be us. Has to be. It has to be us, right? You know, there's something that I'm I'm so disturbed about. I've thought about how I, I'd really like to on this platform, either with you and I or, or um, maybe Richard Flint, but, but you and I um, bringing on somebody from Black Lives Matter or from Antifa and asking them, you know, would you come and, and sit and talk about Freedom Fridays and, and, and just talk, but, you know, to try to identify who the leadership is, is um, a challenge to try to figure out if it would really be safe to do it has been another challenge for me psychologically. So I have not pursued that at all. And, and then as I get to a tipping point and I think, no, I think that this would be helpful. This would be a good idea. You know, we need to hear from people who, um, are so much in the in the limelight. Although it's interesting because it doesn't seem like they are right now, does it? In the news? No, not really. There, there are just so many things going on right now. Yeah, they've kind of lost a lot of steam. You know the 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 other thing is I was watching um, uh, last night. I was watching Vice. Uh, the former vice president, Mr. Biden, on one channel, and I was watching President Trump on another. And I was watching the way that the moderators were treating each of them. And I thought, neither one of those moderators are really very polite. And I don't know who the who the woman was who was interviewing President Trump, but I, but I sure do know George Stephanopoulos and have always really liked him. But I thought to myself, why, why do these people feel like they have the right why do they feel like they have the position? I mean, there is a hierarchical society. <laughs> In a family, there's a hierarchy, you know, like you don't talk back to your mom or your dad. There's a hierarchical structure there. There's nothing wrong with it. It's how we learn, how we function. So there's a hierarchical structure in terms of, you know, you're the students and there's the teacher, then there's the principal, you know, it's all right. Somebody's got to lead everything. So I didn't understand that, but, um, People just seem to sit there. I mean, like, why are people in the audience yelling out, hey, be nice? Because you're right. It's like, well, somebody's going to, well, this will be over soon, you know, or somebody's going to say something. Somebody's going to do something. And then the other thing I was doing this last week, which I found really disturbing, I turned on in my office here. I've got a, a television set up over here and and I will have it on just on mute. And I just kind of look up to see what's going on. And I was watching the... Um, what was day one of what was called the hearing for the Supreme Court Justice Amy Coney Barrett. And I keep looking up there and I thought, what are all those giant sized posters of people? You know, all these different people. So I'd turn it on and I'd listen for a little bit. And I thought, what do they have to do with this woman who's being interviewed to be a judge? I thought that they were gonna bring her in and, and the people in the room were going to hear her answers to their questions. But they were doing all the talking. She's sitting there with this huge mask on. I was glad that she took it off. You know, it must have been that they decided, you know, they were going to asphyxiate her if they didn't let her take it off. I mean, she's sitting by herself for crying out loud. And I'm watching this and I'm thinking, these people are just pontificating. What is the process? Why did, wasn't there someone in charge? And then here was the pinnacle of it. I think it was yesterday at the closing of all that. Diane Feinstein gets in an embrace with a guy who, so she's a Democrat, he's a Republican and, and you know, they like each other. Oh my gosh, heinous. Now, 
her own party is saying she needs to be removed from office. She's too old. She's incompetent. I mean, I, I, I watched her behavior during the, the hearings. I didn't think that she was inappropriate at any point in time. I thought she was trying to press a couple times on things that I was wondering, you know, did you not hear her answer? But, you know, she wanted to press a couple of things, but she was really polite in contrast to other people who were um, really rude. And I felt, I felt, I felt awkward watching some of it because it was, um, there was one, one guy who kept pressing on a, a question with, with uh, the judge. And she said, well, I hope you don't think that I don't have my own mind. And I thought, wow, that's actually a really big statement. When somebody is made to feel like their whole career and their adulthood, I don't care what it is you've done, you know, you're a UPS driver, you're a grocery clerk, you're a wait staff. If we, if any of us make one another feel like, well, you don't have your own mind. You don't think for yourself. You're an idiot. That's so demoralizing, isn't it? Where do we get off doing that, Charlie? Where do people get off doing that? Yeah, it's been going on for a long time. So it's just now, I think, with all the, you know, social media and access to it, that it's just sped up exponentially for sure. But it's always been around, you know, and uh, but I think definitely it was it was in certain places and spaces and now it's definitely more prevalent. Yeah. Um, but the vast majority of people that I run across in a day are 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 are, are fine or friendly and nice and so but we just uh, have to really be mindful and you know we gotta speak up and make sure that that our voices are are as loud or louder than than the voices of, of unreason right the voices of reason so, yeah. so it's just important to have that reasonable mindset and people really are wanting that when they're just not finding it frankly they're not finding it and it's just so important to to have leaders step forward with the right message for the right reasons. Big time. What do you think is going to happen with social media? Do you think it's going to remain a fixture? Do you think that there's going to be offshoots? Are we going to have some other kind of social media? Is social media going to lock down and be really highly censored like it is all of a sudden right now? Um, what What's going on? What's going to happen? Yeah, I mean, it's it's not going to go away. It's a part of society, and it's there's a lot of grow, growing pains with it because it just hasn't been around that long, relatively speaking. And I think that we've had more of a... We've had more government oversight on on certain things than we'd like to believe over the years yeah and and now because of social media and all these things some of these things are coming to the surface and oh wow uh, i'm being tracked oh wow i'm you know all these different things and and uh so it it is a new era and i think there's more positives to it than negatives however like anything, uh, people will find a way, it seems, to abuse it. And, and instead of looking at it as this amazing thing that brings people together, people also look at it as, as a way to separate people through propaganda. And, <clears throat> and we've got a lot of propaganda out there. And I just, I can't speak for other people and how they approach learning, hearing, reading, and I just don't, and there's a lot of people that hear something from one source and just run forward with it instead of really doing their own homework, own research, being well-read, understanding issues, and then seeking answers. So that process is 
is needed to to be able to navigate this new um, environment that we have that social media has created. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I'm I'm thinking about the gang of four. Somebody, nobody, anybody, and then what was the other one? Everybody. Everybody. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, what if everybody? goes into social media and goes to the news outlets and says, be polite. <laughs> you know, we're, we're tired. We're tired of the yelling. We're tired of your screaming. We're tired of your bad behavior. I, I'm, I'm, I'm really tired of people laughing on the media at someone. That's bullying. Yeah, it's amazing that wasn't that one of the initiatives for the first lady was talking about bullying and, you know, leading initiatives to reduce it in schools and this and that. And then, you know, she's married to one of the biggest bullies in the country, right? Um, Really unfortunate. It's it's unbelievable. And uh, so, but I know that when people, you know, rise up in certain ways, their voices get heard very quickly. Things get changed. Uh, But that's when people unite that happens. Right. When people are divided, they can be easily controlled. If you think about it, easily controlled when they're divided, when they're united. Mm. Now, that's why know. that's why I started this platform up, Charlie. Yeah. I mean, the K Factor was alive and thriving, you know, eight, ten years ago, and and we were doing shows uh, every week, and it was a lot of fun, and we were talking about kindness, and and you know, it was lovely. But then, you know, I've been sort of off and on. But this year in 2020, and I didn't start this up again until July, but um, I was just feeling the isolation. And I've been far less isolated than a lot of people because I kept traveling between Chicago and St. Louis and doing business in both places and, and excuse me, taking care of things. But, you know, it's just that the, in my home, I like to be the place that people want to come to. I love being the hostess. I love having people over and cooking and serving and playing board games and cards and laughing, watching a movie and, you know, singing, singing, getting together for that, uh, making a big bonfire outside and, you know, sitting and watching the stars and all that. And in my domestic sphere is sacred to me. I love my home. And I, I love being here. So no matter where my home is at, I'm home is where the heart is. And, and it's like, like, there's nobody coming over. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> you know. So I got a little fish. I mean, you know, Mr. Flurf, who I've talked about, he doesn't fill a lot of needs, but I got to tell you, I go over and I pet him every day, you know, on the outside of his bowl and talk to him and I feed him twice a day and I have him on the dining room table. So I sit and talk to him, you know. <laughs> And, um, you know, I, I moved him into the living room and put him on the, on the, the, uh, what do they call it? A cocktail table. It's not a cocktail table for crying out loud. It's a, you know, like low in the living room table. And I thought, well, now I'm looking down on him, you know, it seemed intimidating and wrong. So I put him back in the dining room, but I mean, this, this whole feeling of being isolated and alone and, you know, talk about a safe space. This to me, what I'm doing on Block Talk Radio with each of my co-hosts is it's a safe space that I can come into every day for an hour. Some days, two shows, some days, three shows. I want to actually do three shows a day and you have three hours of, you know, another person because in this isolation, man, I mean, I got to tell you, I've gotten a little weird sometimes. (laughs) It's been an amazing and how it's affected people and how it's really um, made people feel just not themselves, right? Just yeah. really bottled up and and unnatural. So it's been a significant challenge for sure. It's been a very significant challenge. And have you felt this too? You have felt the weirdness of the whole thing. It's been. It's been a, a major adjustment, I think, for sure. And for me, it's 
you know, getting just really getting into it. And it's interesting because yesterday I had a conversation with a friend and we we're talking about his business, his company. And he was talking about uh, he's got employees that are struggling right now because they've just been trying to get through this. But then he said he has others on his team that are thriving because he said instead of just getting through it, they're getting into it. They've gotten into it. And so I thought that was a great way to put it because I've looked for ways this entire time to say, okay, you know, how can I navigate this mm -hmm. in an authentic way that helps myself and other people? And being able to navigate it, it becomes clearer and listening becomes clear every day. Here's here's things that I can do. Here's things that I control, and and then this is what's resonating, mm -hmm. and what people are asking for, or requesting, and that's been a that's been really eye opening for me. No, I... and and it's and it's also been a and it's also been a way for me to to make just make the most out of this this current season we're in and not say oh wow 2020 was a waste or it was a lost cause or all those things mm -hmm. that to emerge out of this year with a, a, a solid direction with benefits found a way to, to find benefit and find a way to add value mm -hmm. in all of the in all of the chaos so that's how I've I, but it, but it's that's how I've been able to manage. But it's been super challenging, and I think too you have to have you have to lean on support. You have to have a uh, you have to have support, and no matter who you are. And I learned this some years ago when I had a kind of crashed a little bit, and I had a friend that really had a had a group. Like had a really great friends group mm -hmm. that they could lean on, and at times, not all the time, but just people that they could call and talk to. And I remember thinking to myself, "Oh, that's a great thing." And so now, pretty much twenty-four hours a day, if if I needed to call someone, I could. Mm -hmm. And knowing that that support, and then they could call me too. Mm -hmm. and so just knowing that support structure is there is awesome. But that's something that I really wanted to establish, and I'm glad I established it some years ago. And just, and that's just part of growth process is understanding who your friends are and who your friends are not. We we all have to we all have to come to grips with that. Yeah. That I tell people I don't care how many followers you have on Facebook. You got two thousand friends. You don't have two thousand friends. That's right. You don't you know all your friends? You can fit them in your automobile telling you right now yep so whatever size car you have and you're fortunate if you've got if you if your if your car can 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 seat six mm -hmm. and you've got six people that you can call 24 hours a day then you're blessed really so, blessed but you don't you don't have two thousand friends no <laughs> i know it it is it is really stunning isn't it um so do you still have that group yeah and yeah. it's, it's gotten, it's been really solid and, and, but you also have to keep an eye, you know, what is it? Uh, who, who was that that said that was it? I think it was Bush. I think it was George Bush said that trust would verify. Yeah. Yeah. You got to yeah, uh, you do. trust, but verify, trust, but verify. Yeah. And that was the thing that, uh, John F. Kennedy, this is another John F. Kennedy quote I love. He said that, he said that, uh, let me see, civility is not a weakness and sincerity is subject to proof. Wow. Right? Subject yeah, to kidding. proof, right? <laughs> hey, you're my friend. Great. Prove it. Yeah. Prove it. Has COVID been a great time to prove it? Heck yeah, it has been. Yeah, it has. And so 
your friends are proven through COVID, and there's some people that <clears throat> you haven't heard from. They disappeared on you. They never were your friends. Sorry. Mm -hmm. And so one of my things is that if you're not at the if you're not at the table during the famine, I'm not extending an invitation during the feast. I think that that's really good thinking. And I, I, I don't have a problem rinsing through people, but it's been a little tougher through this. It's tough. And, and, and there I've been, you know, I've been surprised and shocked in some cases where there was, you know, there, there, there are people that I've known for decades and at a critical time in, mm -hmm. in human history, they disappeared on me. Yep. And yeah. You've got to, you got to remember that. And I don't, you know, I'm not holding a grudge. You just got to remember. But I'm saying that you, you can't, you can't be in the inner circle. With yeah. The, right. Be. That's just how it is. So, um, yeah. So it's been a, there's just so many lessons. And I think if we get caught up in the frustration and the sorrow and the discord and all those things, we can really miss a lot of the valuable nuggets that have been here for us because, you really got, you know, if you, if your finances weren't as strong as they should be, you found that out. Mm -hmm. If your health is not as strong as it should be, you found that out. If your friendships weren't what you thought they were, you found that out. Uh, if your employer wasn't what you thought they were, you found that out. Think about it. There's so many things we're finding out that 2020 COVID exposed. And so it's so important to view all those lessons, take them in, and then <coughs> respond accordingly. Right. Respond accordingly. What did uh, Maya, the great Maya Angelou said? She said, uh, this was an interview. I remember Oprah had her on her show yeah. years ago. Before I know what you're going to say. Passed away. And Oprah said, at the end of the interview, she said, what is your advice for young people? And I was like, well, I might not be a spring chicken anymore, but I'm still young at heart, so I'm going to pay attention. Right. And she said, what is there a piece of advice you'd give to young listeners? And she thought just briefly. And she, you know, she, she had that great way of speaking. And 90 she said, seconds. She said, uh, well, here's what I would say to you, that when, when someone shows you who they are, believe them the first time. All right. Yep. Exactly. I'll tell you what, we're out of time, but Maya Angelou also said people will forget what you said and they will forget what you did. They will never forget how you made them feel. Yes. And the next time, the next time we talk, I'll tell you about the hour that I got alone with Maya Angelou. Did I ever uh, tell you that story? I remember you talking, saw her in the hotel. Yep. That was pretty awesome. So this is this is Dr. Deb Carlin and Dr. Charlie Cartwright signing out for this week. Peace out. You have a wonderful free, free thinking time of it. And we will see you next time.